Welcome back, everybody. As you can see, this presentation is about poisonous mushrooms. This figure is a fantastic color plate from 1000 American Fungi, published in the year 1900. I really like the devil figure, reading his book about toxicology, nestled among this garden of poisonous mushrooms. Here we are now at the title slide. This presentation about poisonous mushrooms is part of a series for the Wilderness Medicine Fellowship, covering those topics in the overlap between wilderness medicine and medical toxicology. This was created as a companion presentation to the one about poisonous plants, so the learning objectives here overlap. And speaking of learning objectives, here they are. After watching this presentation and studying the relevant supporting materials, learners should be able to name at least 12 poisonous plant and 4 poisonous mushroom species. Common names are okay, but scientific names get you bonus points. Provide details on the molecular mechanisms of the toxicity of those species, when known, and to describe their clinical presentations, and identify at least 3 poisonous plants or mushrooms that have specific antidotal therapies. There are several types of poisonous mushrooms causing different constellations of signs and symptoms. Although some references suggest higher numbers, traditionally there are eight poison mushroom toxidromes. This slide lists them out and indicates the order in which they're going to be discussed. We're going to start with the most general, non-specific, and most commonly reported kind of mushroom poisoning, which results from GI irritation and is otherwise benign. The picture here is of some mushrooms brought in to the UC Irvine Emergency Department for a patient I saw in 2007. The history was that the five-year-old patient and a friend of his at daycare found and ate some mushrooms in the yard around 5.30 p.m. right before pickup time. The mother took her child to a Kaiser Urgent Care where he was complaining of some lower abdominal pain, so they got very concerned about potentially fatal or hepatotoxic mushrooms and turned them away, telling them to go to the emergency department instead. The child looked good in the ED and his symptoms resolved after a bowel movement and eating the McDonald's Happy Meal that mom picked up en route to the urgent care since he was otherwise going to miss his dinner. In this case, the mushroom morphology, the geographic prevalence, that is, the absence of dangerous mushroom species in the area, and the clinical history were all inconsistent with hepatotoxic mushroom ingestion and the patient was soon discharged. Poison control centers, PCCs, receive lots of calls about mushrooms of unidentified species, but which either cause no symptoms or self-limited GI distress. And these exposures are often designated in PCC records as LBMs, or little brown mushrooms. Here, though, we see the most common identifiable GI irritant mushroom. This is Chlorophyllum molybdites, the green spored parasol mushroom. It is found over most of the United States and is particularly common in Orange County, where it is often found sprouting on lawns. The living fungal organisms generating mushrooms are found underground, but they send mycelial shoots up to the surface. Mushrooms are fruiting bodies that grow from these shoots and are the organs that create and release spores, similar to the flowers of plants, allowing the organism to disperse more widely through the air instead of through the soil. Chlorophylla molybdites often sprout up rapidly overnight on lawns during the warmer months. The graph in the lower right shows peak incidence in August through September. Here, we see several mushrooms in a row that probably arose from multiple mycelial shoots sent out by the same organism at the same time, and so are all at roughly the same stage of development. These mushrooms have brownish scales on a wide white cap. In some ways, the green spored parasols resemble hepatotoxic amanita species, since they all have a ring or annulus around the stem or stipe. The amanitas, however, have caps without scales. Here we see a chlorophylla molybdites specimen that has not yet spread out the edges of its cap. The covering layer, or universal veil, has split as the mushroom grew, creating the scales seen on the cap. The scales stick on chlorophylla mushrooms, but fall off of the hepatotoxic amanita species. The last remnant of the universal veil will remain stuck around the stem as the ring or annulus already mentioned. Another differentiating factor between chlorophyllum and amanita is the color of the gills under the cap. Chlorophyllum literally means green leaves, using a bit of poetic license since there is no equivalent Greek word for the gills of a mushroom. Here on the left, we see a light green tint to the gills, which comes from the light green spores produced there. On the right, we see a spore print from Chlorophyllum molybdites. 
To make a spore print, you remove a mushroom cap from its stem, place it upright on a piece of paper, and leave it there for several hours, overnight, or longer. The spores will fall from the gills, as they are supposed to, creating a spore print, which here is notably green. But the green color, of course, is not from actual chlorophyll, which is found in plants and not in fungi. Chlorophyll and molybdites ingestion causes the rapid onset of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and occasionally diarrhea. So if the onset of GI symptoms is within just a few hours, that is reassuring in the sense that it's highly unlikely the patient ate a very dangerous mushroom. These patients are treated symptomatically with IV fluids and antiemetics. While you might consider ordering liver labs, you're doing this only for peace of mind and to help convince the patient that they're going to be okay. The need for admission is rare and is based on whether the vomiting has been controlled or not. Patients who have eaten chlorophyll and molybdites have stated that the mushrooms themselves tasted just fine. If, however, there is a delay of many hours before onset of GI symptoms, then you really have to start considering if it might have been a hepatotoxic mushroom instead, and we'll cover those towards the end of this presentation. The next class of poisonous mushrooms are those that can cause a disulfiram-like reaction. Many ink cap mushrooms are tasty and edible, but contain coprine. Coprine is composed of glutamate attached to 1-amino cyclopropanol. Copro means dung, and many mushroom species sprout from dung. Here we see Coprinopsis atramentaria, which is the typical species people look for to eat, and you see how the edges of the cap are starting to break down. And here is another Coprinopsis specimen that more clearly shows why these mushrooms are called ink caps because the caps literally dissolve into a dark, inky fluid over a matter of hours. The 1-amino cyclopropanol metabolite formed from coprine inhibits aldehyde dehydrogenase, which can result in a disulfiram-like reaction when eaten along with ethanol. The mushroom meal can be tasty and safe without alcohol, but wine seems to pair with mushrooms so well that such reactions should be expected. The poison found in inocybe and cleticybe mushrooms is muscarine. Inocybe literally means fibrous head, which describes their caps, while cliticybe means sloped head, since the caps have an upward slope and are almost cup-shaped. Several mushroom genera contain muscarine, but it's found in the highest quantities in these species. Unsurprisingly, muscarine is an agonist at muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. There are several types of muscarinic receptors. The most prominent in terms of clinical symptoms are the M3 receptors. Overstimulation here causes sweating through action on the muscarinic portion of the sympathetic nervous system and sludge syndrome from activation of parasympathetic end organs. Treatment, therefore, would be aimed at decreasing secretions and sweating, and we'd expect atropine or other anti-muscarinic drugs to have a very beneficial effect. Amanita muscaria is where the name muscarine comes from since the chemical was first found in this mushroom, but it's only there in trace amounts. The main poisons found in Amanita muscaria are ibotenic acid and muscimol. The relationship between ibotenic acid and muscimol is analogous to that between glutamic acid and GABA. Each of these pairs is closely chemically related, requiring only decarboxylation of the acid to create the other. It's notable that glutamate, our primary excitatory neurotransmitter, is so closely similar to GABA, our primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. Ibotenic acid and muscimol are analogs of glutamate and GABA and will bind to their respective receptors, resulting in complex autonomic, neurologic, and psychoactive effects. Of course, Amanita muscaria is the mushroomiest, the most classic, and the most widely pictorially represented of all the mushrooms. We see that it also has an annulus or skirt around the stipe, and it has notable white scales on the cap that are remnants of its universal veil. Psilocybe mushrooms contain psilocybin, which is a hallucinogenic serotonin agonist. While Amanita muscaria can be ingested for psychoactivity, it has so many other potential adverse effects that it's not very commonly used. Psilocybin is a much safer alternative for psychoactive effects from mushrooms. Psilocybin is basically a prodrug and is metabolized into psilocin, which binds to serotonin 2A receptors. At the bottom here, we can see the structural similarity between serotonin, psilocybin, and lysergic acid diethylamide, another hallucinogenic drug with serotonergic activity. One other interesting fact is that psilocybin mushrooms, when bruised, will turn blue, 
and that this might be used for quality control purposes when potentially purchasing magic mushrooms. Here is Gyromitra esculenta, which is edible, as the species name esculenta indicates, but it is poisonous if not prepared properly. Gyromitra species, or false morels, look similar to Morcella, the true morels, which are tasty and avidly sought by mushroom hunters. As you can see, though, Gyromitra are more irregularly shaped and brain-like. The toxin in Gyromitra mushrooms, Gyromitrin, can cause seizures and hepatotoxicity through the same kind of mechanism as isoniazid can. Gyromitrin is a hydrazine compound, which converts to monomethylhydrazine, which is reactive enough that it can actually be used as rocket fuel. If you cook Gyromitra mushrooms properly, allowing the hydrazines to boil off, and you avoid breathing those fumes, they are no longer poisonous. Here is the metabolic pathway explaining hydrazine toxicity. Hydrazines and hydrazides, such as gyrometrin and INH, inactivate pyridoxal phosphate, which is the metabolically active form of pyridoxine, vitamin B6. And you need pyridoxal phosphate to decarboxylate glutamic acid, which is excitatory, into GABA, which is inhibitory, thus depleting GABA, and resulting in seizures. And these seizures may be very hard to control since many of the GABAergic anticonvulsant medications, such as benzodiazepines, simply augment the action of GABA and require that GABA is there in the first place. Thus, just like for INH-induced toxicity, we treat gyrometra mushroom toxicity with IV pyridoxine. Our next group are the webcap mushrooms, and we see here deadly webcap and fool's webcap. These contain orelanine, which causes renal injury. Orelanine exists in two tautomeric forms, and one of these is a bipyridine with two positively charged nitrogen atoms relatively close to one another. And this chemical structure can disrupt cellular redox reactions, causing oxidative injury, which is exactly how the pesticides paraquat and diquat work. With orelanine, the brunt of the oxidative injury is to the kidneys, although it takes some time to develop. Thus, the toxidrome of these mushrooms is a delayed renal injury, with a latent period of a few days up to a few weeks after ingestion. Finally, we are back to the hepatotoxic mushrooms. Cyclopeptide toxins from Amanita and a few other species cause a delayed liver injury. There are several Amanitan compounds which are structurally very similar, but the most important of these is alpha Amanitan. As we've already seen, the deadly Amanita species have a smooth, wide cap and a ring or skirt around the stem. In the upper left, we see a series of Amanita fruiting bodies at progressive stages of development, almost like a stop-action movie of mushroom growth. We also see on this slide, and on the previous one, that these mushrooms go by a few nasty common names like Death Cap, Death Angel, and Destroying Angel. Hepatotoxic Amanita mushrooms are native to Europe, but have been introduced elsewhere. It's not clear to me from the literature if Amanita ocreata, which is found along the United States Pacific coast, is an introduced or naturally occurring species, or even if it's a separate species from Amanita phylloides. Amanita mushroom poisonings are very rare in Southern California, and I'm not aware of a reliable report of its occurrence over the last several decades. Amanita ocreata has been reported in Orange County, but it's quite rare. Most of the hepatotoxic mushroom ingestions in California, on average a few per year, occur near the Bay Area, perhaps because of a higher population of mushroom hunters and or hunters who are immigrants and confuse our poisonous species for edible ones from back home. The mechanism of alpha amanitin is to inhibit RNA polymerase. This prevents DNA transcription, ultimately leading to death of the cell that has taken up the amanitin. Amanitans are heat-stable, so they survive any cooking process and are rapidly uptaken into liver cells, but they take several hours, usually 6 to 24 hours, before symptoms develop. Again, this is why the rapid onset of GI symptoms after mushroom ingestion is reassuring. Of course, it's possible to confuse the situation even further if the patient ate more than one mushroom species at the same time or had more than one mushroom-containing meal. After the initial GI symptoms, many patients have a symptomatic recovery, but can then proceed on to fulminant hepatic failure and multi-system organ failure within three to five days of the ingestion. Treatment for hepatotoxic mushrooms is primarily supportive, but many treatment options have been investigated and have been recommended. 
Potential therapies include gastric lavage, although patients rarely present early enough for this to make a difference, multi-dose activated charcoal to reduce aminitin absorption, high-dose penicillin to compete with aminitin for uptake into hepatocytes, and acetylcysteine as a general liver tonic, similar to how it's used in many cases of hepatic failure of unknown etiology, cimetidine, biliary drainage to reduce enterohepatic circulation of aminitin, octreotide, and silibinin, a derivative from the milk thistle plant. And the final option would be a liver transplant. The figure here happens to show a living donor transplant, but cadaveric works too. Transplants are obviously last-ditch efforts, but you have to start thinking about that possibility early and contact your regional transplant center, since there's a lot of administrative work and a lot of luck involved in this option. And with that, we're done talking about the eight poisonous mushroom toxidromes and have come to the end of this presentation. An apt quote I've heard about wild mushroom hunting is that there are old mushroom hunters and there are bold mushroom hunters, but there are no old, bold mushroom hunters. Terry Pratchett, the humorist and fantasy novel author, has summed it up by saying, All fungi are edible, but some fungi are edible only once.